For the State Controller, Ms. Paquin. Here. For the State Treasurer, Mr. Rufino. Present. Ms. Vargas. Present. For the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Mr. Yamanaka. Here. And for the Director of Finance, Ms. Lee. Vice Chair Higa, you have a quorum present. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. So agenda, the first agenda item is approval of the committee agenda. Um, we are going to um, uh, move a couple of items around in the agenda. We're going to take up um, items five and six um, a little bit earlier in the agenda, just ahead of um, item number four. So um, I'd like to ask for a, a motion to approve the agenda with the flexibility. Second. Okay. Thank you. Um, that has been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Okay. Uh, let's see. Agenda item number two is approval of the minutes from the November 8th um, committee meeting. Any, um, anyone have any questions or changes to the minutes? Then I'd uh, entertain a motion for that. Thank you, Lynn. Second. Thanks, Nora. Um, all those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed or abstentions? No. Okay. Um, let's see, Mr. Jensen, we've got a consent agenda item on the progress report on the uh, auditor's management letter. Uh, yes, this is okay. this is a consent item. It's a, a periodic report on the progress that management has made with regards to implementation of the recommendations that were from last year's uh, financial statement audit. Um, in the report, we 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 um, pleased with the progress that has been made. Uh, management's continuing their efforts and um, in 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 implementing those corrective actions. And as um, as they continue to do so, we'll we'll report to the committee. But generally, what happens is. Um, Crow will, as part of their next audit process, uh, will follow up on those items as well, and they will validate full implementation of those corrective actions. Great. Uh, are there any questions on this agenda item? Do I, I don't think I need to, we don't need to take action on this item. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now we'll go to agenda item number five. Um, it's the compliance risk assessment um, results. And I know that we have um, one of our <coughs> consultants with us. So Larry, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, yes, here today for this uh, item, which is our enterprise compliance services risk assessment, is Maurice uh, Crescenzi, who is a managing director of the ethics and compliance. He's a practice leader with Grant Thornton, and he was also the engagement leader for um, for this um, effort. And also Dina Mount, who is our um, Enterprise Compliance Services Director. In the past, the ARM Committee has asked a couple of important questions. And it, that is, what are the laws and regulations that CalSTRS is obligated to comply with? And how do we know that we're meeting our compliance obligations? And these are really great questions that every board member uh, should be asking. And identifying enterprise compliance risk helps us to understand the regulatory environment in which CalSTRS operates. And um, additionally, the risk assessment serves kind of as a foundation for us upon which the enterprise compliance strategies and, and plan are built. This risk-based approach to compliance allows us to focus our resources on what's really important and to prioritize um, how we will expend our efforts in a strategic manner to accomplish our goals and uh, implementing the enterprise compliance program. On a daily basis, we're confronted with an alphabet soup of rules and regulations. There's the SEC, the IRS, the DOL, FPPC, CCR, the Ed Code, the TRL, just to name a few. And, uh, and then let's not forget that there's the CCPA, the GASB, the ASB, COSO, NIST, and there's also the State Leadership Accountability Act, known as SLAY, which affirms management's responsibility for implementation of proper controls to ensure compliance with the laws and regulations. As you can see, we operate within an incredibly complex environment, and there's a myriad of laws and regulations and standards that CalSTRS is obligated to follow. And these laws and regulations establish hard boundaries in which we must operate and comply with. In addition, CalSTRS adopts its own policies, standards, core values, and contractual obligations. And a combination of these hard, fast laws and regulations, as well as our 
our own policies and standards and, and contractual obligations that we implement, establish a framework for us to operate in. And, and, and it's those guardrails that we have to stay within those boundaries. And so, but when we, when we think about all of these compliance obligations, you know, how do we know what is really important? Or are they all equally important? Well, this compliance risk assessment assists us in prioritization of compliance risks. Okay, so with literally hundreds of laws and regulations to follow, it was important uh, to clearly define compliance risk and ensure we can effectively address compliance risk without boiling the ocean. Within this context, Enterprise Compliance Services recognize the need to conduct a compliance risk assessment. In order to establish a baseline compliance risk profile from an enterprise-wide strategic view, to prioritize ECS resources in a focused manner, and to get into alignment with ERM's operational risk assessment, as well as the internal audits risk functions at CalSTRS. On that note, we brought Maurice Crescenzi with us to help walk you through a high-level overview of the CalSTRS Enterprise Compliance Risk Assessment Process and Risk Profile Development. And with that, I'll pass it off to Maurice. Uh, thank you, Dina, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, nice to meet all of you committee members. Um, so on slide four, thank you. Um, what you're looking at here is a full sort of capturing of the work that we did together collaboratively with, with CalSTRS. And um, just to kind of put it into perspective, it's a lot to take in kind of all at once. The, um, the outer ring uh, reflected in the various shades of green represent the, uh, the ethics and compliance or the enterprise compliance risk domain, sort of the, the big buckets of risk that Larry was referring to earlier. And so we were able to, through a series of work steps, um, define and articulate at a high level those primary buckets of, of enterprise compliance risk. Uh, I'd like to underscore that just because a, a um, substantive area of risk is sort of depicted on that outer ring, it does not mean that, th that we observed any violations in those areas. It does not mean that there have been past breaches in that area. What, it, what it's intended to, to reflect is that based on CalSTRS business model, there are substantive areas of enterprise risk that CalSTRS should either continue focusing on or perhaps be, begin to uh, you know, dedicate additional resources uh, to. So that outer ring is meant to suggest that that, that is, at an enterprise level, uh, CalSTRS compliance risk profile. The, uh, the inner purple wheel, if you will, um, it represents or depicts the design of CalSTRS enterprise-wide compliance program. These are, um, if you count the purple wedges, uh, including the inner purple core of culture, you'll count 10 specific programmatic elements. And the reason why we have 10 is we've designed a framework uh, that we worked with here at, on this engagement with CalSTRS. And that framework, composed of 10 specific programmatic elements, derives from a wide variety of what we call program drivers. The external regulations, the external agency guidance, like the guidance issued from the Department of Justice, certain evaluative frameworks like the United States Federal Sentencing Guidelines, uh, other kinds of frameworks like various ISO standards, um, all sort of coalesce together to form a framework composed of those 10 specific programmatic elements. So it's a long way of saying that inner purple framework is sort of a one-stop shop it's predicated on the external drivers that matter the most when it comes to um, designing an ethics or enterprise compliance program effectively. Um, you'll see that the, uh, the outer green uh, wheel is composed of 10 risk domains that we have worked collaboratively with uh, CalSTRS to organize into uh, sort of priority areas of compliance risk and then um, secondarily, uh, and then, you know, uh, second tier sort of priority areas of risk. Um, you'll note that uh, within each of those 10, 
we have approximately uh, 58 um, sub risks that sort of sit behind each one of those uh, uh, air, you know, risk domains at, at a high level. I guess that's on the next slide, Larry, I think. Right, maybe one more. Right. So this gives you a, a sense of um, behind each one of those high level risk domains, there are numerous what we call sub risks or ways in which those risks may manifest within the organization. Again, this is all prospective. This is a preventative kind of constructive exercise meant to um, get our arms around uh, the risk landscape. This is, again, just to say it again, not to indicate that, there, that we observed any misconduct or any wrongdoing in any one of these areas. The exercise was in the context of continuous improvement and a way to get a better sort of sense and a deeper sense of where there uh, may be enterprise risk to continue focusing on or begin to focus on with more uh, detail in the future. Um. Sorry, um, I've got a question for someone. So let me, um, Erica, you should have the I just wondered if you could walk through how you differentiated, how the group dif differentiated between the primary versus the secondary and what factors were taken into consideration, especially since this, this prospective, it's not looking back at things. Right, thank you, Erica, good question. So throughout the, the course of the engagement, we, um, in the process of identifying risk domains in the first place, that came from a series of work steps, Doc, document collection and review. So we looked at internal policy taxonomies, internal procedures, uh, risks that CalSTRS already has determined to be risk areas just based on your own policy taxonomy or training that you're already doing uh, or other kinds of various compliance infrastructure that you already have in place were indicators that these are topics that you already consider to be risks. Um, we conducted a number of interviews, um, a few dozen. And so during the course of those interviews, we, we gained a deeper understanding of what was on the minds and in the hearts of business leaders when it comes to compliance risk. And so as topics would, would surface, we would explore those topics in more detail uh, and also sort of reincorporate those topics in later interviews to see the extent to which that same topic was also on the mind of somebody else. So we were, we're sort of counting the frequency with which those risks would come up. We also looked at um, our own client portfolio and how other clients of ours have prioritized risk typically. Uh, we, we also looked at enforcement trends, what's going on in the outside world, um, which agencies are kind of focused on which risk areas. Um, and then lastly, of course, just taking into consideration Calster's business model, just sort of, you know, what, what fundamentally just, you know, based on how you operate and, and how you, um, you know, your, your basic business process, what risks are fundamental to the business? So like investments, clearly, again, I'll, I'll say it again, not that there was any misconduct observed and not that you're not doing a nice job in investments, but just based on the business model, investments will always be a top priority here. Um, if you contrast that against a, another area of risk, like maybe anti-discrimination and anti-harassment, um, we're not saying it's not a risk. We're saying it, it warrants attention, but at like a secondary level, um, maybe unlike one of my clients is one of the world's largest airlines. And when you look at that business model, and sort of how they generate revenue and how they staff aircraft with flight crews and flight attendants. Um, in that client's case, anti-discrimination and harassment was a top risk. Yeah, so is that helpful? Yeah, yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, thanks Erica. Um, there's one other. Okay, Lynn. Thank you. Um, why was the Budget Act identified as a secondary focus area? Take that one first. No way. Um, for hi, hi, Lynn. Hi. Um, for the, the same reasons that we um, that I just sort of articulated, I guess in our view, in working collaboratively with the engagement team, uh, concluded that it's an area of compliance risk. It, it made sort of the, the, the top ten, um, but that it's been a risk that's been kind of identified and focused on historically, and, and you guys are. Um, doing a nice job with that. Uh, so we wanted to keep it kind of on that list of top 10, uh, but, but not as a moving forward kind of next phase area of focus. 
I guess my question was more, what is it about, maybe this is for Larry, but what is it about the Budget Act that yeah, makes let, it? Let me reasonable? add a little more context to that. Um, not in the sense of the Governor's Budget Act, but within our environment here at, at uh, CalSTRS, our internal budget. And, you know, the Budget Act um, sets forth our allocation and then managing those resources within that allocation. Okay. Right, is the area of focus here. And so perhaps we, you know, I, it's, it's a, it could be a broadly construed as the, like the Governor's Budget Act, but it's really with, with our level of compliance internally and managing those resources. And so it has to do with some of those sub-risks are really kind of funding some of our initiatives, mm -hmm. such as our pension system and uh, other, other initiatives that we have in the organization, such as even creating this compliance program. And also with regards to um, our workforce and uh, competitive recruitment type of issues that we might face and, and if there's any, any um, uh, budget type of, of um, boundaries that we have to work within uh, in order to do that. And, and uh, so it's really more internal, not, not necessarily the broader state budget act. Okay, thank you. I understand with that explanation. I guess when I was looking at it, I was assuming you meant the broader state budget act. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for bringing that to our attention. We can, we'll make an adjustment there. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And um, so just, I, I've got one question. So just to clarify, when we talk about sort of a primary and a secondary focus area, um, all 10 are areas that will be part of our program, but in terms of the, the next steps, which I think you've, you're going to go through on the next slide, you're going to go through the next steps first with the five areas in the, in the primary focus area and then move to the secondary focus area, but uh, during the, in the sort of medium term, it, or, you know, they'll all be um, addressed and be part of the program. Correct. Yeah. So the, the program would encompass all of those domains. Yeah. And um, what this does is just helps us prioritize where, where to really begin. It's not to say that there isn't <laughs> important risks under the secondary focus area, because there are, obviously, with regards to financial reporting or or anti-discrimination and harassment, both of those are, are, are big topics. And, and so um, if you think about, I think you had mentioned the number of, of sub-risks there, the, the, the full portfolio has 75 to 80 total sub-risks, whereas the um, primary focus area is uh, around 50 mm -hmm. sub-risks as well. So it just kind of helps us prioritize where we're really gonna focus our efforts in as we roll out the program, and and um, and as, as part of the challenge in in implementing a new program like this is, you know, you can be subject to uh, mission drift, and and you can you know really get involved in a lot of things, and so this really helps us um, establish the, our direction, right, and and where we're going to apply our resources going forward. Great, Thank yeah, you. but eventually, yes, we will include all of those areas. Great. Okay, so the next steps for Enterprise Compliance Services is using the compliance risk assessment results as our guide. We will further develop the Enterprise Compliance Program through a series of work steps, which include Using each of these um, activities or, or groups of activities, um, and I'll just call out a couple of, of them specific to each one. In the first group about mapping risks and laws um, and regulations and policies, we're going to cross-reference each risk and sub-risk to the related laws, regulations, policies, and standards that we currently have here at CalSTRS. We will develop risk mitigation strategies We'll collaborate with ERM and internal audits on a consolidated risk assessment approach. We'll develop and implement a monitoring plan for the primary focus risks first, followed by the secondary focus risks. And again, that's based on somewhere to get started and resources. Um, and knowing that this is our 2019 plan and we're already three months in, so it's we have nine months to, um, to tackle as much as we can during that time. And then monitoring enterprise-wide risk mitigation strategies, as well as any emerging risks. And those will be our next steps going forward um, in using this risk assessment result um, to develop our compliance plan. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, 
Bob or Dr. Yetman, I don't know if you have any um, questions or comments. Mm -hmm. Pardon me, Judge. My brain's, uh, it's late, it's slow, and I need coffee. It's coming up. Got it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a couple. Maurice, thank you for your work with the organization in this respect. Um, as you were joking with me earlier, and you didn't use the joke, so I'm going to do it for you, but uh, you reinvented the wheel. And um, I think it's a very nice way to think about and frame these risks. Of course, the, the difficult part is not in creating the framework and in building this wheel, it's in implementing it. And so um, I would encourage the board to think about um, uh, the use of external experts and um, how they can perhaps help us not only get this off the ground, but to maybe do a mid-course evaluation or, or not evaluation, that's the wrong word. What's a better word? A mid-course, well, okay, yeah, what? Evaluation, I'll go with it. And, um, and say, okay, here's, you know, here's, where you, here's what you wanted to do. I helped you get this, this wheel. It's a nice wheel, and here's, now you're thinking about your, you've got a risk assessment. But to come back at some point in time, I don't know what time is right, um, but to say, okay, here's where you are. And, and certainly that's a function of, um, Larry will be helping out greatly with that uh, in his function as in internal audits. But it, it couldn't hurt to have the, you know, the, the father come back and help take a look at the child once in a while. That, that would be my recommendation to the board. Um, and second, as, as you build out the uh, compliance study, Dean, I know, you, I know you'll do this, and we've talked about this before, but um, as, as you know, there are a lot of really, there's a really a lot of solid compliance work already being done within the organization. It's, it's not an organization that lacks a compliance system. It was just an organization that lacked an overarching um, sort of compliance plan that took a broad look at compliance across the organization. But certainly within various units, investments would be a, a, a stellar example of a robust functioning compliance system pre-existing this effort. And so any efforts that went forward to map the, uh, to create the compliance function should, of course, um, work with and engage with these pre-existing compliance efforts that are already going on within, many of which are functioning quite robustly and have been, quite frankly, for decades. So, um, so back to the wheel. I want to make the joke twice, just because it's, you know, it's 5 o'clock. It's late. But you know, let's not reinvent the wheel twice. Right? It's, <laughs> uh, we did it once, and, it, and it's great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much um, for, for your work, um, and, and Dina, for you know, working um, with Maurice and Larry on doing the assessment. Um, yeah, I think you said it when you made your opening comments, um, Dina, that uh, you know there there is so much. And um, Larry, one of the earlier slides you showed that had the logos of all the different agencies and um, you know regulators and sets of rules that we have to comply with throughout the organization. And that probably wasn't even a complete list. Right. And our you know our external landscape continues mm -hmm. to change. So um, you know finding a way to um, help us identify the, the biggest priorities. Um, to, to build that umbrella or that framework, I think was um, was what we really needed to be able to, um, you know, sink our teeth into something and and move forward. Um, uh, you know, I think the other thing to remember, in addition to the comments from Dr. Yetman, is that um, is that our world continues to change. You know, whether it's um, uh, you know in the uh, sort of you know private sector itself, um, you know, within state government, within the federal government, and so I think it's also just going to be important for us to be. Um, to be flexible um, if we find that there are new issues that emerge or new risks to, you know, reprioritize or, or uh, you know, change the approach that we're taking um, if, if we need to. Um, mm -hmm. But, exactly. you know, based on the feedback, it seems like a, um, you know, a really sound, sound place to start. Yeah, this is not a, a one and done process. Yeah. It's an ongoing process mm -hmm. that will consider, you know, emerging issues and, and, uh, and I think the, the, you know, the, the, the touch, the, the point that you touched on with regards to collaboration and the, and the other parts of the organization is really key to, to all of this. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in our next agenda item um, some more. But uh, what we didn't want to do here was create an impression or recreate um, an, a new enterprise risk management kind of a process, right, that's just specifically focused on compliance. We want to be able to... Uh, work with our enterprise risk management group and 
and dovetail in these processes into already existing uh, risk management processes throughout the organization. And to the, to the extent that we can do that, um, that way we're, we're building in rather than trying to bolt on and create new processes and things like that. And so I think that will be very helpful. And then going forward, we'll consolidate all of the, the risk assessment activities. Great, yep. great. Uh, let's see, I've got one person in the queue. Nora? Um, so maybe I, help me with this process. I'm trying to find it, figure out um, where do members fit in into this compliance wheel? Um, so let's say a member feels like there is something that has been not complied with or somebody's not following up. I know we have the benefit in services, but how do we incorporate that into this bigger wheel? Because there's so many levels of it to make sure that, you know, I really, I, I, I love compliance and I, mm -hmm. <laughs> in all the different levels, but I'm wondering a lot of it, this, this is the internal piece of it. And so how do we incorporate members as well, I guess is my question. Um, well, well first, first of all, one of the activities um, that we're going to talk about in our in our next item here is is implementation of a uh, of a reporting function mm -hmm. that members will have access to. Okay. Either through the internet or through the phone, okay. and they'll be able to contact us with any concerns or any questions that they have that we can provide guidance to them and and be a help, um, direct them where they might need to in the organization with regards to compliance and ethics type of issues. And then, um, you know, I think under the, the other aspect that's really, really important to members is under the, the pension reporting area, right? Because, and the pension funding area, because that's really all about, you know, our system, right? And their, 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 their contributions that they're making to the system along with the employer, right? And investment of those monies uh, in compliance uh, with, the, with our, you know, boundaries that we have to operate within, and and also ensuring that we have accurate benefit payments for our members would be included in there, and uh, and just overall kind of, you know, that, that life cycle of, you know, contribution to, you know, retirement uh, phase for the member would be included in there, and so those are all really key areas. And the reason why I ask is because on the service plan process there is very clear like employees speak up there's like actual plan on how we do it internally that there's it doesn't get called out and so mm -hmm. I was just that's where my question comes from and then the second one I guess would be to encourage stakeholders to also be engaged in this process as mm -hmm. well so not just the members but the stakeholders also have avenues to be able to share because they work so closely with all of us all of the um, uh, representatives from the organization as well so somehow incorporating that Calling it out, I think, would be important. I don't know where specifically yeah. it says, even though I think it may be assumed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we, when we, um, one of our goals is to promote the what we call see something, say something. Yeah. Right? I love that. And that applies um, internal and external, right? So all of our members, all of our, you know, employees, um, any, any level of concern, whether it's coming um, internal or external to the organization, our stakeholder concerns as well. But I really appreciate your idea of engagement and, and uh, having the, the, the stakeholder involvement there. And we'll, we'll um, maybe work with Grant to see how we can promote that a little more. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Mm -hmm. I think we can move to agenda item number six. That's compliance services plan. So oftentimes um, we're asked, what exactly do you do? And uh, an annual compliance plan can really quickly answer that question and, and show where we add value to CalSTRS. And the plan also kind of sets up guardrails to keep us focused as we um, continue to implement it. And, and I think as was indicated earlier, um, you know, the creation of, of this com enterprise compliance program uh, wasn't as a result of any instances of non-compliance or any issues or, or, or um, uh, things like that. It was, it's really, it is a strategic goal in the context of continuous improvement. And so there was a, in our, in our 16, 2016 through 19 plan, um, and in our, in our business plan as well, um, there was a strategic initiative to implement this, this program. And so we're doing it from a very strategic um, 
uh, perspective and not as a result of any uh, misconduct or wrong wrongdoing or anything like, like that. And the strategic initiative um, really stated in the mission of enterprise compliance services is to assist the organization to prevent, detect, and respond to potential violations of laws, regulations, and policies. And to fulfill this mission, we created goals and a number of activities um, underlying each of those that, that we're going to um, share with you here in just a second. And since our last report to the committee, we, we've, we for those of you who might not be familiar with this, we provide uh, a periodic report to the committee, but we've made some significant strides in developing and implementing the Enterprise Compliance Services Program. And I'm going to ask Dina to review a few of those for you um, that we've been working on. All right, so our compliance services plan builds from the compliance risk assessment results, identifying risks from an enterprise-wide compliance lens, and using a best practices framework to prevent, detect, and respond to instances of ethical misconduct or the potential of not meeting our legal compliance obligations. As previously mentioned, focus forward efforts include collaboration with ERM and internal audits on a consolidated risk assessment approach to avoid risk assessment fatigue across the organization. In January, we launched the CalSTRS Automated Policy Management System, Epicenter. This was the culmination of a year-long effort working closely with the technology SharePoint team in-house. Epicenter offers a standardized format for CalSTRS policies in a searchable library that provides version control and an annual review notification of review due dates. And the exception to this is board policies that are governed on a different timeline that we don't manage those. We just include them in the searchable library. I think since um, implementation of this um, centralized library, I think we have over 150 internal policies that are included in there. Um, we've had 25 so far that are reviewed and standardized and, and have been updated, refreshed, if you will. Um, and we have 18 that are currently underway, and, and uh, our goal is to assist the organization in working through um, all of those policies throughout the remainder of the year. So we're continuing efforts to establish a compliance and ethics information and anonymous reporting system, which will be accessible to staff and the public. Once we select a vendor and finalize the scope of work, We'll create a messaging campaign to inform and educate staff on the new system, develop policies and procedures for the use and expectations of the helpline, and have ongoing trainings and education opportunities for staff to take an active role in See Something, Say Something, which will be our campaign. This slide details the many activities either currently underway or planned that ECS ambitiously hopes to achieve with the remainder of 2019. These nine categories correspond to the nine framework components from the purple inner wheel that Maurice presented earlier. Um, the framework is predicated on key regulatory requirements and other leading practices that organizations with mature ethics and compliance programs generally find to be effective. Within each of the framework categories, there are inextricable relationships between effectively designed ethics and compliance programs and related risks that it is intended to manage. Examples from each category include um, under governance and oversight, we're going to update the charter for Enterprise Compliance and the ARM Committee. Under risk assessment and due diligence, we're going to develop risk mitigation plans for those primary focus areas. Under codes, policies, and procedures, we're going to design compliance policies and procedures that we've been working on up to this point, but we haven't documented quite as well as we need to. During training and communication, we're going to design a compliance training com curriculum. For employees speaking up, we're going to develop an employee speaking up campaign that will coincide with hopefully the launch of our hotline once we get it established. Under case management and investigations, we're going to in establish incident policy and procedures. Under compliance monitoring, we're going to develop a monitoring plan. 
Under third-party risk management, we're going to collaborate on strategy development to address third-party risk at CalSTRS. And to manage the program, we're going to have ongoing recruitment efforts for staff and their pursuit of their CCEP certification. This is a, a very um, ambitious plan with a lot of functional activities, as you can, as you can see here. And, and uh, we're glad that we're, um, we're able to bring on some additional um, folks to help us and, and uh, with the team. And this plan really shows how the enterprise compliance services adds values to CalSTRS and, and, and will continue on uh, focusing on building uh, the program, especially working with other compliance partners across the the organization as we integrate these activities with enterprise risk management, audit services, and program areas such as um, procurement, information security, human resources, and investments. And, and these partnerships that we will have are um, critical for uh, maintaining that holistic view of risk across the organization. And, and you know, traditionally in the past, we've, we've um, left it up to each individual department to determine, you know, their compliance, um, extent of compliance monitoring, and, and um, as well as ensuring that they, they're maintaining compliance with all of the laws, rules, and regs that are applicable to them. And, and this effort for com enterprise compliance services pulls all of that together so that we have one, one view across the organization. And, and Again, uh, it's a pretty ambitious plan, but we'll provide periodic reports to the to the committee, and um, we'll create a new plan, and that we'll present to you in November of 2019 for 2020, actually, and then report the results of this to you about this same time next year. Hi, I think I have a couple of maybe rookie questions. Um, Tina, you mentioned risk assessment fatigue. Um, can you explain what that is? Sure, yeah. So um, enterprise compliance is relatively the new kid on the block. We, we've only been here for about a year and a half. Prior to us arriving, there's an annual enterprise risk management risk assessment. Um, internal audits does a risk assessment. It's to sort of stop it happening on multiple levels and have it happen once and incorporating all of the elements that are needed from an enterprise compliance risk assessment process so that we're all um, included in that process one time instead of three separate times so that everyone isn't seeing oh, another risk assessment. Here, I have to answer more questions. Okay. Yeah. And then um, under employees speaking up, and I think you were talking about a hotline, developing a hotline, how is that different or maybe it's incorporated into what could become a more formal compliance monitoring plan. I know you also have, um, uh, it, it was in item five as well, sort of part, the next steps would be developing that monitoring plan. So it all, I mean, maybe it's all kind of going towards the same goal, but if you can kind of differentiate um, some of these other steps with what a compliance monitoring plan might look like. Um, okay, so two. I think there was two questions there. One was the hotline. Um, the hotline is going to be a very separate, um, independent effort that we're, we're going to work with a third-party vendor to establish an entire um, reporting system. So uh, internal, external folks will be able to either call in or go in through uh, an email portal um, and submit complaints or ask questions and get concerns answered. So that's one of the efforts that we're going to um, be implementing under our, our activity, our planned activities. Um, the other question was uh, I'm sorry, for monitoring. Before, before you leave that topic, I just want to yeah. jump in there. You, you know, we want to uh, continue to maintain and, and promote a culture where people feel free to ask questions, you know, to, to make sure that we're operating within that ethical and environment when we're making business decisions and, and we can be a resource and provide guidance to them. And if they have questions or, or they note issues that they feel need to be discussed, you know, we want to first, you know, encourage them to talk to their managers, right? And, and if not, and there's other avenues, there's human resources and there's our EEO uh, function here within the organization and things like that. But if people, um, you know, are not comfortable with that or they want to remain truly anonymous, then this provides an alternative for them, right? And so it's not necessarily our first go-to 
uh, area, but, but it is a resource that provides for anonymous reporting. Um, and you still have an option with that, right? They can uh, provide anonymous information or not. But it's available to both internal and external parties. So yeah. thank you. Um, and the other part, the monitoring, is on an ongoing, regular, annual process of determining whether or not existing internal controls are where they need to be. So for the different business areas that currently have risk mitigation activities going on, we'll go and monitor those and make sure that they're um, mitigating them as, as reported. Um, so if someone says, okay, so we went from having, you know, uh, red hot heat map risks down to a yellow medium risk, we'll, we'll look for, at documentation. Um, how did you get from that high risk to the low risk? Um, so it's, it's monitoring the, the um, internal controls and the, the mitigation strategies to make sure that they're, that they're happening as reported. And as a result, the finding is that it's not going from red to yellow, or maybe it's going from yellow to red. Is there a, a pivot? Is there a point where um, um, those, you know, the monitoring leads to some sort of you know, conclusion or finding, and then there's the next step after that? You know, we just that. started building out the plan, so we haven't, we don't have all the steps built in yet, but the idea is to identify um, areas where uh, there are weaknesses or where there is a, a lack of, of solid, substantial uh, processes in place and make recommendations and assist those business areas. Compliance is very unique in that we are a part of uh, and we can assist the business areas in strengthening their internal controls. Um, and so that's going to be our strategy going forward is to work with those business areas mm -hmm. to help them identify areas where they could maybe evaluate their policies. Are their policies strong? Are their policies, do they have enough policies to cover their, you know, the issues that are within their, within their scope? Um, so we'll be evaluating each one of those in the primary focus areas, um, which are not necessarily tied to business areas, but we'll look for subject matter experts in those, in those um, domains and identify whether the, the, the policies and the procedures and the internal control processes there um, are as strong as they need to be. Okay. And I, I think another advantage of that would also be helping to prepare the program areas for an audit, right? And so if, if uh, you know, a compliance can assist them in that effort and, and if, there, if necessary, can also suggest and recommend, you know, an audit of the area in which they, there may be some formal corrective action activities as well. Okay. So um, that concludes our, our plan here. And, and uh, I don't know, Maurice, did, you know, did you have any thoughts with regards to our plan that we uh, put together and our approach here and that you might be able to share with the committee? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I've got a couple of thoughts, just I guess, um, just briefly here. Uh, is it okay if I follow back with, with Erica just on that last question? Did, did we... Uh, close that out for you. I know you, one of your aspects of your question had to do with the linkage between the helpline and the idea of monitoring. Did, did we cover that question off? Right, right. because something, something not good is happening. Mm -hmm. um, whereas a formal compliance plan would be just that. It would be, right. you know, yeah. checking on things that, uh, uh, on your plan and seeing yeah. if you're, um, you know, mitigating the risks, as you say. So I just wanted to, I'm just trying to work through it myself to understand the, okay. the different yeah. aspects of the plan. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Under the uh, case management area there, that last bullet point, evaluate and report on cases, and, and those are what are reported through the hotline, mm -hmm. part of that evaluation process would be, you know, um, running those particular issues through that risk framework. So in other words, if we notice a trend in reporting, um, certain types of issues that are reported, um, you know, do we have, we would assess, you know, is there opportunities to uh, enhance our policies that we might have or create new policies? Is there, um, is our training robust that covers the types of issues that are being reported, mm -hmm. right? And so we can, 
enhance all those activities that we're doing now um, as a result of our evaluation of those cases. But on the monitoring, we're in, I think, a little deeper looking at, at even transactions and policies and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So, th th thanks. I guess just, I guess, um, big, big kind of takeaway. Um, there's a lot involved in the plan, uh, clearly. Um, I guess my two cents is that in any organization, compliance is a journey. Um, we've got clients of all shapes and sizes at various points along the way in the journey. And what I like about the plan is that, you know, we've got action steps for each of the programmatic elements from governance through policies and procedures, through case management, through auditing and monitoring. So we've got the, the basis covered and it reflects uh, an effort to make progress on that journey. Um, and so that's one big sort of takeaway. I, I like that we've got, you know, each of the 10 elements or the nine elements here uh, spoken to. And, you know, in a sense, the 10 boxes would be static year over year and the bullets underneath them would evolve as the program evolves. Um, the other big takeaway I just want to just underscore um, in the interest of time is that Larry touched on it earlier uh, and Dina made the point too that enterprise compliance is about a year or a year and a half sort of new here at Calsters. And the fact that the organization has as part of its strategic plan created an ECS function or, or a program is very much in line with evolving leading practices. Um, in all of our clients' cases, if you roll the clock back a couple of decades, compliance was managed at the functional level. HR managed the EEOC stuff, in this case investments, managed investment compliance. It's, it's very consistent with all of our clients now and in line with agency guidance to have more of an overarching kind of integrated view of compliance across the organization, which in turn allows for more holistic reporting to the governing authority, which is you guys. So, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, thank you for the opportunity to have been here and to have worked with you guys on the project. Um, good stuff. Thank you. So it's not necessarily a question, but I, I want to make sure that I'm on the same sort of page with all of this, because when I think of compliance and, and the work that we do is really to ensure that we're minimizing the risk for the institution, right? That's really the goal. And ultimately, the systems of compliance are created to ensure that is, is it a systemic problem or is it a human problem? And you create these systems throughout the process so that it's not a, hey, we got you, but uh, in trying to be punitive, it's really about how do we ensure that our systems that are in place are working so that we are minimizing the risk of the institution, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yep. pre prevent, detect, and respond yeah. is really our motto. Yeah. And so if we can prevent it, that's the best case scenario yeah. for sure. And I think that if, the more we talk about it that way, um, I think it strengthens the culture of the organization and, and really, uh, I think, makes people feel like well, it's not like I'm going to call on, tell on you or any of that sort of behavior that sometimes can create a really negative culture in right. an organization. Right. Thank you. Agree. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we'll have the folks from Crow come up to present our um, financial statement audit plan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Go ahead. Okay. You ready to proceed? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So um, this is our um, our team uh, uh, from Crow, who are our financial statement auditors, and annually, Calsters is required by law to obtain a um, an audit of our financial statements. Management, of course, is responsible for the preparation of those statements. Um, but as a component unit of the state, uh, we receive an opinion from our external financial statement auditor. Uh, and it's important because that financial information eventually folds up into 
the state's financial reporting as well. And so Crow is already underway um, with this year's audit for, for the fiscal year 18-19, um, and, and I'd like to introduce the team today. Uh, we have Brenda Torres, who's our signing partner, uh, to my, immediately to my left, and then Kevin Smith, who's the engagement and relationship manager, and Jim, Jen Aris, who's the managing director, uh, and then also Tim Canop um, with us today, who will be kind of outlining what they call their client service plan, and it's their approach to the audit this, this year, and uh, advise the committee on that, and then answer any questions that the committee might have. Okay, thank you, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Larry, for the introduction. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the Audits and Risk Management Committee, it's always a, a pleasure to be here. Um, as Larry stated, my name is Brenda Torres, and I'm an audit partner with Crow, and I am the signing partner on the engagement. Um, we're going to take you through this presentation, as Larry said, um, to articulate our client service plan. Uh, the presentation is really for you, so please feel free to interject and ask any questions as we go along. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our team um, so that you're familiar with the way in which we approach the engagement, especially from a team perspective and the level of expertise that we bring to the table. We'll also share with you our overall services and deliverables so you know what to expect, what we're doing through the course of the engagement, as well as what you should expect on the back end when we're here in November, presenting our results to all of you. We'll go through the timeline and the approach. And then we'll also talk a little bit about our required communications to all of you as those charged with governance. So I think Larry stole my thunder. I was going to introduce the team. Um, you know, I've had a pleasure to work on this engagement for, for a number of years. Um, and, you know, we work with management, but we report to all of you. So it's very important that you keep that in mind in your particular role. Um, like I said, I'm the signing partner. Um, Kevin has also been with me in this entire journey. He serves as the engagement partner, um, client relationship partner, and really leads Crow's um, public sector service practice for our entire firm. Um, Jen Aris and Tim Knupp haven't been with us this whole journey, but what I would say is they've been great additions to the team. This is Jen's second year on the engagement and Tim's fourth year. And I think what's unique about the four of us and why the four of us are here today is that, you know, the four of us work well across all engagement team members. Um, you know, you have a, a very large organization with a number of different uh, business units within the organization, a number of individuals that we work with at Kelsters. And based on the timeline, we also need an army to get the audit done in a timely fashion. Um, but this is kind of your, your main team in a, in a meeting earlier today. I think I referred to Tim as the quarterback and uh, Jen is the offensive coordinator. And I think Kevin and I are somewhat coaching. Um, but really, if you have any issues that come up uh, during the engagement, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Uh, as Brenda mentioned, we have a bit of an army that works on the CalSTRS audit engagement, and so we've highlighted for you here on these next two slides uh, really the key players who we consider to be subject matter experts, and we've really uh, worked to build the audit in a way where we almost have kind of mini audit engagement teams, and then the four of us uh, oversee all of those areas. So um, Brenda did a nice job introducing herself, Kevin, and I. Uh, we really have two partners within Crow that oversee the audit of investments, uh, the first being Mike Van Dyne, who's also local here in our Sacramento office, uh, really overseeing the methodology that we apply in auditing the investment portfolio. And then we have a partner, Chris Moore, who is our investment valuation specialist and actually leads the pricing de desk for Crow internally uh, and is really, again, just focused on the valuation of, of all of the portfolio. Uh, we have a partner, Craig Sullivan, who is a certified information systems uh, auditor, and he really leads our IT team that takes a look at all of the financially significant systems within the organization, looking both at uh, what we refer to as ITGC, or general controls over IT, as well as uh, very specific controls over those financially significant systems that lead into your financial statements. We have two senior managers uh, that are really focused on the audit. Uh, the first is Ron Gaysink, who uh, oversees the procedures that we perform on a sample of the employers every year, and um, works closely with member benefits in, in performing those procedures. 
Dan O'Malley is another senior manager who has been with the engagement team since the beginning of our contract. And he has a very specific uh, specialization within both the audit of investments and data analytics and has been working uh, closely with all aspects of our audit team in uh, incorporating data analytics and, and really uh, using his expertise in that area to help with the audit procedures. Rich Paraloo is a senior manager who works very closely with partner Craig Sullivan, uh, again, overseeing those IT uh, procedures that we perform focused on those financially significant systems. Uh, Tim, you've all had the opportunity to meet here. And then, you know, really the rest of our army is comprised of a number of specialists that we utilize. Um, we outsource with GRS uh, from a valuation perspective and looking at the actuarial reports. Um, we utilize a service called Harvest Investments to obtain uh, support from a valuation of investments perspective and uh, really, you know, perform some additional uh, tests and checks of, of those investment valuations. Uh, we utilize a disabled veteran business enterprise for performance of some of our audit procedures, and then have a number of audit seniors and audit staff that work both on site uh, with the team as well as remotely to audit all of the uh, key transaction cycles of the, uh, of the uh, institution.